Yep, we can see it. Great. Let's see if I can get it to move. Of course not. Hold on, everyone. There we go. Okay, so uh, we really have no financial disclosures. We basically work to support, to support our dog. Those were our previous two guys who were with us for 15 and 16 and a half years, Buck and Satchel. And B.B. King, our current dog, is laying in his wicker bed right here in our room. I hope not. So why should we care about use of CBD and THC? Um, largely because people will value our opinions as healthcare providers. Uh, our patients really want to know about these things. Many of them are using them. Uh, they will ask you about the risks. They'll ask you about side effects. They'll ask you really about, are they beneficial? And so as clinicians, we need to understand these drugs. We need to know the differences between um, CBD, Delta-9 THC, Delta 8 THC, we need to know what's in medical marijuana and what isn't. And it's important to understand that our patients are not very well knowledge in this area. Up to a third of Americans think CBD is the same as marijuana. It's not. Uh, CBD is one of the two major compounds in marijuana but THC is the major compound that we see in marijuana. And when I say THC, I'm referring to Delta-9 THC, which is the natural THC product found in marijuana. And when we talk about CBD, we have to realize also that there is a pharmaceutical grade product that is sold called Epidiolex. And because it has been produced as an FDA approved medicine, uh, that changes how we think about CBD uh, when people use it non as a non-prescribed medicine. Let's ask Dr. Ballister. I think he had a question. I wanted to make sure that we answered that before we go any further, if he has a question. Oh, yeah, it's a really simple question. The between the nicotine lozenge versus the gum, any difference? As far as milligram potency, no. Or, or effective. There's, eh? a, there's a two milligram and a four milligram potency. We normally would recommend a four milligram potency for most people. So the gum and the lozenge, the lozenge is just a, perhaps an easier way for someone to utilize that for nicotine cessation. Um, both need to be parked and both should be allowed for the, the buckle absorption. And if you have any questions further, we can answer those independently. Uh, I'd be happy to talk with you. I'll give you my contact info and we can go through that. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Sure. So essentially, there's no difference, uh, you know, maybe patient preference. Pre it's largely patient preference. It is. Right. Great. Thank you. So when we use the term marijuana, what are we actually talking about? We're talking about the leaves and stems of the cannabis sativa plant and, and, the, flowers. and the flowers. The flowers are where the high or the buds, as they're sometimes called, are, are where the highest concentration of THC exists, but there are lesser amounts as you go down the stems. There are over 400 substances in the cannabis plant. And that means that from one plant to the next, from one growing season to the next, you're getting different combinations and amounts of the substances that you get. So it becomes very difficult to really say that you're getting the same amounts of things when you have so many substances and they range over 
the the height of a plant and depending on the growing season and everything else lots of of different problems for standardization and when we talk about an fda approved drug what we're talking about usually is a single source compound or perhaps two compounds we're not talking about 400 substances that can vary based on sunlight strain uh you know all these different things so it's it makes it even more difficult to uh do studies that can do repeatable kinds of potencies and also to create a product that can be assured to be a certain thing at a certain time for a certain patient so there are two major components to marijuana. The first is delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol or THC, and that is the psychoactive component. That's the component that causes the euphoria, the dizziness, the out-of-body experience, the slowing of time. It's what gives marijuana its high. And when we talk about marijuana and we talk about the potency of marijuana, it's really determined by the amount of THC. The higher the amount of THC, the more potent the marijuana is. Uh, the potencies have changed over the years, whereas back in the 70s, marijuana that you would typically get had maybe four to 8% THC. Now, if you were to buy marijuana, the potency is 15 to 25 percent, and you can get even higher potency marijuana than that. You know, 50 percent is not unusual. If you go up to 70 percent, that's called hashish. So CBD or cannabidiol is the second most common ingredient, and it really functions as an antagonist to THC. So cannabidiol in its purest forms does not cause any psychoactive effects and may actually blunt some of the psychoactive effects of THC. Cannabidiol is of interest from a medical standpoint because it's thought to have antipsychotic effects, immunomodulating effects, and anti-inflammatory effects. Uh, we also know that it has anti-seizure effects. Um, the issues about all of these effects is that for the most part, these are theoretical. There's not much evidence except for its value as an anti-epileptic drug. And uh, even then, as an anti-epileptic, it's actually not a first line. It's treatment. an add-on, and it's for pretty rare types of pediatric epilepsy. So as I said earlier, the potency of marijuana is measured by the content of THC. And the more THC in a in a, the marijuana plant, the less CBD. And because on the in the marketplace, people want the higher high, we are producing marijuana with much more THC and much less CBD. So let's talk a little bit about Delta-8 THC. Delta-8 THC is really found in minuscule amounts in the hemp plant and in the marijuana plant. In the raw extract. I keep going the wrong direction. There. So the, the point to make here is that it is, yes, it is a naturally found substance, but it is found in way too small quantities for people to actually use it commercially. So we're gonna come back and talk more about Delta-8 THC and how it differs from Delta-9 in just a minute, but let's first talk about CBD. So uh, let's talk a little more about CBD as a pharmaceutical grade product. There, there is only one product available. It has uh, less than 0.1% THC. So I talked before about the single source products, how important it is if, if something is going to be FDA approved, it needs to be a reproducible, repeatable kind of product. And Epidiolex uh, was able to uh, be found to be that kind of a product where it can be uh, repeated. It is less than 0.1% THC. 
initially they scheduled it as schedule five with, within the Controlled Substance Act. Um, but however, just in the last uh, six months, it has now uh, been pulled out of controlled substance use and it is no longer controlled. That doesn't mean that it's not prescription. It is a prescription drug and needs to be written as a prescription. It's not available on the open market at all. There are many drug interactions with CBD products and with Epidiolex. What's interesting about Epidiolex is it's often the eighth or ninth drug added to the medication regimen for these very uh, difficult often infant, two-year-old and older, infant uh, uh, epileptic uh, kiddos. And um, the other indication for Epidiolex is tuberous sclerosis, which is, you know, another very rare um, problem that allows uh, patients another opportunity for something third line to be provided for the patient. There are many drug interactions with CBD, generally speaking. It interacts with many of the cytochrome P450 uh, isoenzymes, and we need to be very, very, very concerned about that because people who may get uh, varieties of CBD on the street may have no concept of this and may get in a lot of trouble if they are on other medications. Uh, and interestingly, people who take, those youngsters who take Epidiolex oftentimes get uh, abnormal liver enzyme levels uh, and uh, elevated um, uh, enzyme, the transaminases and uh, potential liver toxicity. And this is not an unusual problem, but that's how serious it is to uh, consider using this either in intermittently if you are on medicines or uh, daily um, without any kind of healthcare professional involved. All other CBD products that come from either marijuana or hemp and of course, hemp is part of um, the cannabis sativa plant, but it, hemp is just a different variety from marijuana. All those CBD products federally are considered illegal drugs by the FDA. That's because there is one approved uh, product, Epidiolex. And when there is one approved product, any other forms of that uh, medicine are considered illegal if they are not approved uh, as safe and effective by the FDA. So it's a very important concept that we need to make sure you all understand today. So to be considered CBD, the product has to contain less than 0.3% THC. So all those other forms of CBD, if they're not Epidiolex, which is specifically even less THC, any other form of CBD has to have less than 0.3% THC, or it is considered marijuana. And usually to get to this level of THC, a reduced level of THC, it needs to come from hemp. CBD may not be sold federally as a dietary supplement or in food. No matter what the states have decided, and we can talk a little bit more about that later, um, because there, there are states that have done things with hemp uh, as far as regulating various products. Uh, CBD literally cannot, because it is an illegal drug, it cannot be sold as a dietary supplement or in food. And if it crosses state lines, you know, that's a federal crime. So uh, other than Epidiolex, all those other CBD products, and there are many CBD containing products, they have not yet been shown efficacious in humans, nor have they um, been evaluated by the FDA. 
And they may contain not just CBD, but they may contain other cannabinoids. Let's say it's marketed as CBD, but it really isn't pure CBD. Then it may have many of the other uh, 100 or so cannabinoids that are in marijuana can be in those CBD products. So this is a very um, difficult area and trying to decipher what a patient has purchased or what a patient has taken can be quite a challenge. So uh, CBD may have Delta-9 THC or it may have Delta-8 THC in it. Delta-8 THC is a metabolite of Delta-9 THC. And it also, as we've mentioned, occurs in trace amounts in the raw extract of marijuana, not in significant amounts, but nonetheless, uh, it is there. Poisonings of children's and pets are on the rise with CBD, um, sadly, and poison centers uh, getting thousands of these reports are very, very concerned. So what is Delta-8 THC? Well, I mentioned it's a metabolite of Delta-9, Glenn also suggested that it's in the raw extract uh, of marijuana at, in trace amounts. Uh, and it does uh, apparently have some euphoria, some intoxication, some relaxation effects. Uh, although many of these have really not been thoroughly investigated. So we still don't really know uh, a huge amount about Delta-8 it is less potent due to the weaker binding to the cannabinoid one receptor. And the cannabinoid one receptor, as you all uh, I'm sure may reflect back on our marijuana talks, the CB1 receptor is really the one involved with the psychoactive effects of uh, the product. So if I can just interject for a second, one of the selling points of Delta-8 THC is that you that it's sort of marijuana light, that it's a lighter, less potent form of marijuana. They call it diet weed. And the issue here is it's not that the that the compound is produces a different type of euphoria or a different type of psychoactive effect. It just is a weak, it's bound more weakly to the CB1 receptor. And so to get a similar effect that you get with Delta-9, you just need to take more of the Delta-8. But it binds to the same receptor so far as we know. It's not a different high. It's just less potent. It's and like smoking marijuana from the 70s as opposed to marijuana from today. And that's in its pure form. The problem is that people really would very rarely, if ever, get it in its pure form. And, and let's move on to why that is. Um, to get a larger amount than the trace amounts that are available in the marijuana plant, uh, one would have to uh, take the hemp and uh, get the CBD from the hemp. And then from the CBD, use even more chemicals. Uh, oftentimes these are toxic chemicals. They can be household chemicals. Um, it's interesting to see what people will do to manufacture this. Uh, and in order to create those chemical reactions to get larger quantities, those chemicals that are used remain in the residue. So uh, Delta-8, THC is very, very rarely what it says it is on the label should you go to a head shop or a gas station to purchase it. Delta-8 products have not been evaluated or approved by the FDA, and they are not uh, safe, uh, as we've mentioned, to be assured of any of the effects. You know, people may want to choose it because they think that it will be less potent and give them maybe less of the bad effects, uh, the, the overriding uh, harmful effects than 
uh, delta-9, but that may not be true because there may still be delta-9 and other substances. And in fact, uh, that is the way we see uh, the product created. We see oftentimes that there may be delta-4 THC or delta-10 THC or other harmful ingredients created by the chemical reactions, not just used as toxic chemicals to do the actual chemical uh, reaction. So we must really help our patients know that we can't trust the labeling. Um, oftentimes we can't trust the labeling of dietary supplements. Well, we can't trust the labeling of Delta-8 THC either. So we've talked about the labeling. Heavy metals oftentimes are part of this um, mixture of items that are created or that have been in the um, substance previously. A, a lot of times heavy metals is just um, an active grouping of uh, arsenic or lead or mercury or cadmium that may be even in the dirt used uh, to uh, propagate the plant. Um, and along with these other cannabinoids of which there are a you know, hundred or so in marijuana, terpenes uh, may also be in the product, in the final product that's sold as Delta-8. Terpenes uh, are in the marijuana plant um, in, in that 400 mixture substance that we talked about when we talked about the composition. And terpenes are responsible for the flavors and the smells of the different marijuana strains. And some terpenes are very harmful. So, you know, we really, um, we see many, many different possibilities here of what is actually in these products that are being sold in the vaping store or in the gas station, wherever. So the claims that are made on the labels um, usually are unstudied or unproven claims, and they may put consumers at risk um, versus if it were an FDA approved product and we knew for sure that it was a certain thing and there were repeatable risks or repeatable therapeutic benefits. The FDA has received uh, not just with CBD, but with Delta-8 THC, many thousands of adverse event reports. They seek more, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. They are very concerned about kids and pets and poisoning. So the side effects that you'd expect with Delta-8 THC are really pretty much the same ones you see with Delta-9 THC. You can see hallucinations, you can see GI upset, vomiting, tremor, anxiety, dizziness, confusion. Um, and again, it's if you push the dose of Delta-8 THC, it functions very much like Delta-9 THC. Um, the real issue here is that when people convert CBD to Delta-8, there are lots of chemical byproducts and you can have heavy metals, you can have a number of different chemicals. I think what you have to appreciate with this is that this is not manufactured in a pharmaceutical plant where people have to follow good manufacturing processes, uh, that the places have to be clean and they have to follow regulated procedures. I, I like to think of this in terms of the old um, bathtub gin. This is stuff that people literally can make in their kitchens uh, or in unregulated factories, and then they can sell it on the internet, in gas stations, in head shops. And there's nobody really looking at what are the contaminants in things like Delta-8 THC. In spite of the concerns, its use has grown exponentially. I mean, the use is up, you know, 850% between, you know, in the last, between 20, 
20 and 2021. Um, and, you know, somewhere about one in six marijuana users also use Delta 8 THC. So as we mentioned, uh, in that bathtub gin or um, in the basement where, you know, they sweep up whatever and put it into the chemicals, uh, there may be household chemicals that are used to be mixed or to be used for conversion. Uh, and changing the color of the final product requires additional chemicals. So um, there is such uncertainty and, you know, we're not trying to just hype this uh, harmful effect. We recommend that, and I didn't put it in here, but um, the FDA has recently done a, a fabulous webinar on Delta-8, THC, and CBD. And I highly recommend uh, that you uh, go to their website and find it uh, on their webinars. Uh, it is a very helpful thing. The FDA, uh, as usual, their hands are tied about a lot of these things. The reason that Delta-8 THC um, is not an illegal drug is because there is no FDA-approved uh, Delta-8 THC. And so consequently, the FDA really has no information about evaluation of it or safety of it or um, running random trials of it um, unless it's a uh, investigational new drug, uh, which you know the manufacturers would submit. Well, no manufacturers, or I should say that I'm aware of right now, there are minimal uh, manufacturers that are interested in doing that proper procedure um, because it is a very, it can be a very overwhelming process to find ways to get this from trace to large quantities. You know, that in and of itself is a difficult thing. We wanna just highlight the MedWatch program um, with the FDA. It's, it's a very important thing that consumers and that healthcare professionals utilize to report any suspicious situations. So the FDA has been very frustrated um, with this whole topic. Um, they have now submitted to Congress the need to identify new strategies for CBD because it really doesn't fall into the, diet, the dietary supplement laws, the DISHA Act. Um, CBD is an illegal drug and cannot be uh, in dietary supplements legally. That doesn't mean it isn't in them because there are many CBD con containing dietary supplements out there that are illegally on the market. And it can't be mixed in foods and beverages, but yet just this week, uh, one of the major beverage companies is bringing out a CBD product. Um, so it's very frustrating. The FDA writes warning letters to manufacturers and it's very hard uh, for them when they have limited roles in all of this uh, to control the CBD and the Delta-8 THC production. So the FDA is working with state and federal partners. Uh, this is a humongous market. And that is um, just you know, with the illegal products, the products that have not been approved by the FDA. Um, it, it, we see in pet catalogs all the time, pet products, that people think they're doing something really helpful and wonderful for their pets. Uh, and, you know, here are these CBD containing products. And again, if they're CBD containing, we don't know what they really contain, but yet they give them to their pets or they, they have them in gummies at the house and the kids get them, you know, so this is a big concern. Uh, there, there are warning letters that it, you can read on the FDA website. Um, and, uh, of course, you know, 911 is very important to call if somebody is in trouble. Uh, and then reporting to the, the MedWatch uh, online or by phone. So I just want to put this in a little bit of perspective. I mean, 
there's this is a huge potential market. You know, we're talking about greater than thirty billion dollars. And whenever you're talking about large sums of money, we're talking about lobbyists. We're talking about influence on our politicians. And so there is a lot of pressure to try to find a way to get these products out to people and to sell them. And many of our big companies, um, Coca-Cola, Coca -Cola, Anheuser, Bush, uh, you know, many big food producing companies want to sell this stuff because they know there's a market out there. The issue is that this is a prescription drug in the form of Epidiolex. CBD. CBD is what we're talking about here. And there is no place where we allow prescription drugs to be put in food or dietary supplements or beverages. I mean, can you imagine, you know, Coca-Cola with aspirin or Coca-Cola with maybe Viagra. I don't well, know. And we see dietary supplements often uh, promoted for erectile dysfunction often have illegal uh, Viagra in them. And, you know, that's, that's a prescription drug. But we it's should illegal. not expect prescription drugs in our foods and in our beverages. And so the, the FDA is sort of in a conundrum because there's this huge market out there that wants to sell CBD, and yet the regulations say you can't put a prescription drug in food and beverages. And so they've gone back to Congress and said, you need to create you know, a new mechanism so that we can protect we can, uh, we can protect people from some of these harmful products. And the, the problems um, appear more frequently in the 21 states that now allow the recreational marijuana because access is easier. So there are manufacturers that can get recreational marijuana and then um, you know, do with it what they need to do. Here is the MedWatch information. I don't know if any of you have ever used it or studied about it. It is a very important thing for all of us to know about. Uh, they have both the phone number, fax number, but they also have an online consumer complaint coordinator. So you can actually communicate with a real person. Uh, and the pet issues are tremendous. So you know, making sure people can report that is um, extremely important. Poison centers, as you know, um, are reduced in numbers today because we don't have the funding that we should have for poison control centers. And they are overwhelmed with these calls. They just uh, can't even handle some of the, the numbers of calls that they get about these products. You know, Delta-8 THC is not unlike bath salts. I don't know if, if you, you know, have run across bath salts. Synthetic cannabinoids like K2 or spice, where they fall in between a lot of the, the legal ease. They are one uh, tiny amount uh, separated from marijuana synthesized, manipulated in, by a carbon or a hydrogen or a couple of little things, and they become a new product. And that new product has never been evaluated, never been um, informed uh, for any of its benefits or risks. And consequently, when uh, those of you in the emergency department, you medical students, people who you know, begin to clinically evaluate these patients, uh, they are stymied because they are seeing all kinds of effects that they can't account for. And that is a huge, huge issue with this whole area that we've got to uh, really do a much better job helping patients to understand that yes, CBD may someday hold promise for certain things, but today is not the day unless you are uh, in that very small population of 
uh, the the seizure disorders, the orphan di disease category. We just don't know enough. Uh, and I know that doesn't stop a lot of people from, you know, the opportunity to have fun with trying new and different things. Just a point about MedWatch. MedWatch is not limited to CBD and Delta-8 uh, THC. Any pharmaceutical product for which someone has... Or dietary supplement or... Any biological substance. If, if you have, if somebody has a bad reaction, if somebody has uh, something of concern, you ought to let MedWatch be aware. So we added this slide just to let you know uh, of what products are approved by the FDA that are in the cannabinoid category. We talked about Epidiolex with CBD. There are only several other products that are actually FDA approved. We've talked about these in our marijuana discussions before, but dronabinol in the 80s was approved. It is a synthetic THC product that can be, uh, a prescription can be written for. It is really considered the gold standard uh, and a, a package insert of dronabinol goes a very long way to learning how to understand the THC potency issues. Um, of the dronabinol, there are two products. One is called Marinol. It's a gel capsule. It's Schedule 3. And the other is Syndros. It is an oral solution, and it is Schedule 2. They are approved for uh, mainly the nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy. Some have uh, used uh, the, the product Nabilone, Sesamet, uh, not just for the, uh, the issue of uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, but also as a uh, appetite motivator. Uh, and Nabilone is scheduled to, it is related to THC synthetically, but it is not THC. None of these are marijuana. They are synthetic THC. And those are the only other products the FDA has approved that are single source reproducible products. And oftentimes, uh, it, it, it might be reasonable for a patient to try uh, the dronabinol sort of product uh, if it is the chemotherapy issue uh, that is causing their difficulty uh, before you ever move into a medical marijuana. So it, it does give us at least a little bit of choice uh, and uh, can be helpful to patients. There are certainly groups of people who should not be getting medical marijuana or CBD or Delta-8 THC. And those include people with an active or previous psychotic disorder or active mood or anxiety disorder. Uh, people who are pregnant or planning to become pregnant or breastfeeding really should avoid all of these products. Um, We've talked in the past, marijuana can increase blood pressure, and so we also recommend avoiding it in people with unstable cardiovascular disease or uncontrolled hypertension. People with significant neurologic problems um, are more likely to get side effects from uh, THC products, and so again, you want to be careful about that. And we talked earlier about CBD causing uh, elevation in transaminases and its multiple drug interactions. Uh, we'll just take a minute to just make the point that there are clearly risks in pregnancy related to the use of marijuana. Um, and it should not be used in marijuana. And there are places where marijuana, recreational marijuana is legal or medical marijuana is, is used, where people are saying, oh, you have nausea from your pregnancy, use 
marijuana to treat the nausea. And that's just a very bad idea. Cannabis fetal syndrome is the result. There is no treatment. It is an ADHD-like phenomenon with no treatment. Uh, and we are seeing more and more and more babies born with this disorder. So pregnancy and marijuana, CBD, Delta-8, THC, they do not mix, period. Now, I, I'd like to open it up to questions. We've got references here and you know lots of information, but um, if we could take some time to chat with you about perhaps some of the things you hear in your practice or things that you are wondering about, we'd be happy to do that. 